go record. All right, welcome everyone. So tonight we're going to go over the readings for the 29th Sunday in Ordinary Time. So let's go ahead and start with our prayer. Uh, by the way, today is the Feast of St. Luke, the Apostle, the Evangelist. So um, if you're wondering, that's that's why the prayers are the way they are. So in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father, you chose Luke the Evangelist to reveal by preaching and writing the mystery of your love for the poor. Unite in heart and spirit all who glory in your name and let all nations come to see your salvation. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Okay. So uh, the readings for tonight, I, I think I'm, I'm not going to say that they're 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 simple, but they're they're pretty straightforward, and but they're good, and and I think they give us a lot to think of. Oh, I mean, I mean, I guess any reading out of the scriptures is good, but they're they give us something to think about, and even if they're not what we might consider complicated or needing a lot of explanation. So let's go ahead and, and we'll jump right in. So the first reading is from Isaiah, and it's talking about Cyrus. And, and so one of the things I want you to note as we're going through the reading is that, so Cyrus is the king of the now, so the, remember, Babylon conquers Judea, and the Jewish people are, are a good bunch of them are exiled and taken into captivity in Babylon. All right. So now over the course of time, the Babylonian pot, Babylonian empire has now become the Persian empire. Okay. And Cyrus is king. All right. And Cyrus is the one who uh, decides to let the Jewish people leave Babylon and go back to Israel. And not only does Cyrus allow them to leave, but Cyrus uh, even pays for the rebuilding of the temple and the rebuilding of Jerusalem. So, so Cyrus really, through his generosity, um really allows the Jewish people to be reestablished, okay, uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, so that's kind of setting up what is happening in, in uh, Isaiah. And that's why Isaiah begins with, if you look, he says, thus says the Lord God to his anointed Cyrus. So he's even talking about Cyrus as someone being anointed by God. But it is something to note as well that Cyrus is not Jewish, and there, and for all the historical evidences we have, Cyrus never became Jewish. Certainly, he never converted or anything like that. Cyrus remained a a Persian pagan at the time, um, but yet Isaiah says, "Thus says the Lord to his anointed Cyrus." whose right hand I grasp, subduing nations before him and making kings run in his service, opening doors before him and leaving the gates unbarred. For the sake of my servant, for the sake of Jacob, my servant of Israel, of Israel, my chosen one, I have called you by name, giving you a title, though you knew me not. All right, so that's a, that's a, a a really important thing that's going on here, that he's saying that Cyrus is his anointed, and that he's his right hand I grasp, meaning like he's he is supporting him, he is leading him, and he is opening doors before him and leaving gates unbarred that he might conquer. Okay, but then he qualifies it. You see that colon there leaving gates unbarred, colon, for the sake of Jacob, my servant of Israel, my chosen one, I have called you by name, giving you a title, though you knew me not. So 
Isaiah giving the words of God is saying, God has done all of this for Cyrus, not because of any virtue of Cyrus on Cyrus's part necessarily, but for the sake of Jacob, for the sake of Israel. Okay, that he has given Cyrus all of this because ultimately Cyrus is going to help God's plan for Israel be realized um, from the human perspective. And he says, though, because he says, though you knew me not, but because Cyrus is receptive to God, okay, because again, as human beings, we can always say no, right? Um, we, we can always refuse when God comes to us, when God makes himself present to us, when God is trying to lead us in a direction, you know, we can, we can always refuse that, but Cyrus doesn't. Okay. So even though God says, though you knew me not, but then he says, I am the Lord and there is no other. There is no God beside. So he's trying to tell, he, he's giving Cyrus the option. He's, he's making himself known to Cyrus so that Cyrus can recognize him for who he is. Um, and that Cyrus will not be just an instrument of God, but he would be a willing participant in the plan of God. And he says, it is I who arm you though you know me not, so that toward the rising and the setting of the sun, people may know that there is none besides me. I am the Lord. There is no other. So he's saying there, there are no other gods. You're not serving one God among many. Um, you're not looking for which God is going to give you what you want. You're not looking for which God is more powerful. There is no other God. There are no gods, lowercase g, plural. There is only God, and that's the Lord. Um, and that, uh, you know, I, I like where, uh, I think it's in, in the book of Wisdom, you know, he talks about like all of the idols that the pagans worship. You know, he says, at best, they're just inanimate objects. At worst, they are potentially demonic spirits that they're worshiping because there is only one god that's it you're either worshiping the one god or you're worshiping something else um and we can have a mistaken understanding of who the one god is that we worship and that is kind of what you see isaiah getting at if you read the rest of the chapter uh you kind of see isaiah getting at maybe cyrus cyrus doesn't know who God is, he certainly doesn't understand him in the revelation of the Jews. Through he doesn't understand that, but he does. He does, in some sense, recognize that God is God. He just doesn't know what to do with it. Okay, so the point of all this then is that. Even if we don't really know who God is, even if we don't really fully, fully understand who God is, which I find this very comforting, I'll just throw it out there. Even if we are maybe even mistaken about who God is, if our hearts are open, as Cyrus was, at least in this moment, if our hearts are open to God, God can begin to work with that, right? God can begin to work in us even as he tells Cyrus, though you knew me not, right? Even though your understanding of me is imperfect, I can work with that because there's something in you that wants to do what is good, that wants to do what is right, and I can work with that, right? Um, that it, it's kind of, you know, the whole... And, you know, we talk about it in a derogatory sense of, you know, you give someone an inch and they try to take a mile. Well, but in the sense of God, we want that. If we can give God an inch, God will take a mile. Right. If, if, if we can open up that crack in the door, God will come flooding into the house. We just have to be. And, and I find that a very comforting thing because it means that 
our feeble attempts at living a holy life in a lot of ways that's that's all god needs to to get in there and and work okay um and that the holy spirit can kind of take over at that moment if we can just give the give if we can give the holy spirit an opening the holy spirit can work wonders okay that so that's what's going on here um and that is also i would say leading into this theological concept of that all of human history and all the players quote unquote right in human history everyone and everything is working towards the fulfillment of God's plan, whether they know it or not, whether they recognize it or not. Cyrus is part of God's plan, and he is working towards God's ends, whether Cyrus knows it or not. And you're going to see that when we uh, get into um, the, the gospel with Caesar, same thing. And I know we've kind of talked about this before, but, you know, uh, I, I would say the, the quote unquote great example of, of this idea is that they knew nothing about the God, the true one true God. But yet when, you know, because the Greeks conquered uh, the Mediterranean world and, and, and much of the Middle East, you end up with a common language. And you end up with common a common written language and a common spoken language. And that paves the way for the Romans to come in. And then the Romans come in. And what do they do? They build roads. They, they, uh, they unify the empire. And you have the peace of Rome, which again is, I'm not saying that the Romans were not barbaric and all of these other things, but comparatively, Within the Roman Empire, you had relative peace and relative safety and security, and you could travel well-maintained, well-built roads in relative safety. Um, it wasn't like, you know, traveling in, you know, the United States in 1810. If you, you know, as soon as you left, you know, if, if, if you went west, well, I wouldn't even say west of the Mississippi River, if you went west of the Appalachian Mountains, you took your life into your own hands, kind of, that there was no guarantee, but but the Romans had built this, this relative safety and security, and but what the Romans did not realize is that the, the, the things that the Roman Empire built and established so that they could control their empire is what actually made it so easy for quick for christianity to spread so quickly so that's kind of the idea that you are doing what i want you to do and you know me not right but the romans are still part of the instrument of god's plan even if they don't know it uh even if they don't wreck it so that that's the idea okay any questions or comments or anything about isaiah um, so, so like I said, I think the big thing to remember is Cyrus, in some sense, his heart was open to God, even though he didn't fully understand what he was open to. And that through Cyrus, God freed the Jews, brought them home and reestablished Jerusalem, reestablished the temple. Okay. And this is all done through Cyrus, who was not Jewish. And it also, again, should bring us some comfort in knowing that that God really can work through anyone who is willing to let God work in them. OK, and we don't really know what happened to Cyrus later. Um, we just don't know. But but anyway, in this instance, he did something good. I also like, you know, again, as I, I've, I've said this before, but it's like C.S. Lewis talks about that. That. Everyone is part of the building of the kingdom of God, right? That's not your choice. You don't get to decide whether or not you're going to be part of the kingdom. The kingdom is here. Jesus said the kingdom is at hand. The kingdom is coming. The kingdom is definitive. Um, 
the question is, you know, again, are you going to be a willing carpenter building the kingdom or are you going to be a brick? Right? Are you going to be used as a tool and a and a building material or are you going to be one of the people who who willingly and lovingly participate in the building? Okay? So that's that's that is the choice we get to make. Not we don't, we don't get to say it's kind of the whole just we can say i don't believe in god that doesn't in any way diminish god's power it doesn't in any way you not believing in god does not make god any less real you denying that jesus has all these power has the power that he has does not in any way take jesus's power away it just means you're going to be on the wrong side of it that you are missing out because you are refusing God's invitation. That that's all it means. Um, okay, moving on then to Matthew. So so it says the Pharisees went off. So this is um, in Matthew's gospel. This is all taking place during Holy Week, uh, and this is part of the time where all the different groups are coming to question Jesus. The Pharisees went off and they plotted how they might entrap Jesus in speech. They sent their disciples to him with the Herodians. Uh, so real quick, who are the Herodians? The Herodians obviously are the people that are the Jewish group that is aligned with Herod. Okay, with the, with the house and the dynasty of, of the Herods. Saying, teacher, we know that you are a truthful man. And that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. And that you are not concerned with anyone's opinion. Uh, flattery. Okay. For you do not regard a person's status. <clears throat> Tell us then, what is your opinion? Now remember, <clears throat> why are they asking him this? Because they are looking for a way to entrap him in speech. Okay. Okay. So they ask the question, is it lawful to pay the census tax to Caesar or not? Knowing their malice. So Jesus sees their hearts. He knows this is a trick question because if Jesus says, no, it is, it is not lawful for a Jew to pay the census tax, then now Jesus is encouraging insurrection and rebellion, and they can go tell that to Pilate. Okay, and Pilate will have no choice but to arrest him because now he's he's a rebel. Now he is encouraging people to to disobey and rebel against Rome. Okay, now if he says yes, it is lawful. Well, now he's a conspirator. He's a co. He, he is siding with the oppressors. He's like a tax collector, right? He is cavorting with Rome now. So however he answers the question, they've quote unquote got him. And that's why it says, knowing their malice, Jesus said, why are you testing me, you hypocrites? which is a great statement because the Herodians are hypocrites. Because if anybody is in league with the Romans, if anybody is trying to play both sides, it's Herod and it's his followers. Because on the one hand, all of their power comes from their relationship and their obedience to Rome. But yet they also have to legitimate themselves to the Jewish people because they want to be seen as legitimately the king of the Jews. OK, um, so they are hypocrites. On the one hand, they say, we are Jews. We are like you. We are your people. We look out for your interests. But on the other hand, they're saying we do whatever Rome tells us because Rome is the one that keeps us in power. So they are absolutely hypocrites. So Jesus says, why are you testing me? you hypocrites. And then I love what Jesus says, show me the coin that pays the census tax. Then they handed him the Roman coin, which is an interesting thing that Matthew tells us because it would be 
uh, it would make a Jew unclean to handle the Roman money because it has the graven image of Caesar, who was worshipped as an idol, on the coin. Jesus doesn't have a Roman coin in his pocket, right? But he says, show me the coin. So they reach into their pocket and produce the Roman coin. So they are admitting their uncleanliness and they are admitting their relationship to Rome. Again, proving their hypocrisy, that they're asking Jesus if it's lawful to pay the census tax when in their pocket is the very coin that you would use to pay the census tax. So he said to them, whose image is this and whose inscription? They replied, Caesar's. At that, he said to them, then repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. This is a beautiful, beautiful teaching that Jesus gives them in this moment. The coin has Caesar's image and inscription on it. So therefore, the coin rightly belongs to Caesar. So in the political sense, there is nothing wrong with you paying taxes to the legitimate authority. Okay. But then when he gives them the caveat to that statement and to God, what belongs to God, he's talking about themselves. Because if the coin belongs to Caesar because his image and inscription is on it, well, then you belong to God because whose image and likeness are you created in? Whose image and inscription do you bear? So sure, give Caesar the coin. Who cares? But you give to God what belongs to God, which is yourself, your heart that it doesn't matter who you're paying your taxes to if your heart belongs to God, okay? And they did not want to hear that, right? Because what Jesus is doing is essentially, again, calling them out on their hypocrisy. And he's saying the same thing to us, that we are created in the image and likeness of God. We are baptized into the life of Christ. So whose image and inscription do we bear? Christ. So give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Pay your HOA dues, pay your taxes, pay your car registration, whatever. Who cares? Okay, that's all part of living in a society with a political structure and an authority. Okay, but more importantly, you give to God what belongs to God, which is yourself. And, and, and that's the hard thing to do is to give ourselves completely over to God, because that means a, 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 a dynamic shift in the way that you live, in the way that you think. Um, and of course, it should be a good way, right? It should be a, a good shift, but especially in the beginnings, it can be difficult and painful. Uh, and very often, and I will say not, not that it bothers us, but very often, um, you know, the way that God helps us to grow in our faith is by allowing us to go through things that separate us more and more from the world and from the things of the world, right? Uh, and and that can be very difficult for us because nobody wants to suffer. Um, but God is saying, okay, you know, it's, it's, I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's the peeling the bandaid off, right? It's, it's going to be a little bit painful and you got to get through it, but, or, or, you know, I even liken it a lot to like, uh, training, like physical training when you're, when you're training for some kind of, you know, a marathon or you're training for some kind of activity that you're going to do, um, the only way that you're ever going to get stronger is to push yourself to your limit. Okay. If, if you always just do the bare minimum, you're never going to grow. You're never going to get stronger. You're never going to get faster. Your endurance is never going to increase because you're never actually doing anything that's forcing you to endure or forcing you to use the muscles 
as much as you can or whatever it may be. So, you know, we are, we are so willing to say that I'm going to push myself physically or mentally or academically or whatever it is to achieve this goal. Well, sometimes with our spiritual lives, God says, I'm going to, I'm going to push you. I'm going to push you past where you thought you would go where you that, so that you will know that you are strong enough to do this and that you're going to come out of it stronger. Um, and, and of course, spiritual strength is much different than physical strength. I remember the Marine Corps, they used to love to tell us dumb things. Like they would say, remember pain, pain is just weakness leaving the body, you know, and say, Oh, what a, Oh, come on. But sometimes you do have to kind of think about it like that. Like it, it's not, I mean, it's kind of a dumb thing to say. It's it's a very macho kind of thing to say. But on some level, it is trying to get you to have an attitude shift about what you're doing. Instead of saying, I need to run five miles, but I don't like running, so I'm going to quit at three miles because I'm tired. You say, you know, the pain is the weakness leaving the body. And if I, I I push myself to keep going, even though I don't want to, and even though it hurts, well, guess what? I'm going to realize all of a sudden, you know what? I can, I can run five miles. And once I've done it, well, now I know that I can do it. And all of a sudden it doesn't hurt so much. And, and, it, and it's, and it's not as painful and it's not as challenging. Um, and with our spiritual lives, we do the same thing. And, and again, it's all about the, uh, it's all about the uh, the attitude that we have. I'm gonna I'm gonna real quick. I don't know if I've suggested it to you or not, but I'm gonna real quick suggest to you a a book. Um, it's very short. It's a very uh, easy little book to read. Spiritually brilliant. Um, I'm just typing it in right. So it's called searching searching for. And now I'm realizing I can't spell maintaining peace. Um, and the priest, it's a, written by a priest and his, uh, and his last name is Philippe. So there you go. Yeah. Searching for and maintaining peace. It's like, I'll show it to you. It's, I mean, it is a, it's it's a tiny, tiny little book. And it's 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 maybe what is it? 107 pages. Um, and 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 it's the kind of thing that you can read in little paragraph spurts. But it's a, a lot of it is about this this idea, this very idea that we find uh in giving ourselves wholly over to God. Um or if you want to, if you if you, you want to jump over and look at Thessalonians, so the reading from Paul. So Paul says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, remembering you in our prayers, unceasingly calling to mind your work of faith, and labor of love and endurance and hope of our Lord Jesus Christ before our God and Father, knowing, brothers and sisters, loved by God, how you were chosen. For our gospel did not come to you in word alone, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with much conviction. That the Thessalonians, he's saying that they are, they are, they are showing their faith in their endurance and hope. Right. And that's what a lot of what this little book is about. It's about how God wants us to have the peace and the joy that only he can give. But a lot of us have a lot of things we have to let go of before God can really do that. And sometimes the pain and suffering that we go through is God trying to get us to let go of these things that are 
preventing us from knowing real peace, real joy, real happiness. Um, and we have to let go of these things that are the fake, the false happiness of the world, the false peace of the world. You know, a lot of times I think, you know, we think of peace just meaning nothing bad is happening. But that's a very fragile kind of peace. I mean, we've all lived our lives in enough years to know that if if you define peace and happiness to basically mean nothing bad is happening, how fragile is that vision? Because it might even it might not even last the day, much less years and years. But the peace of God, the peace that God wants to give us, the, the joy that God wants to give us is an abiding peace and an abiding joy that weathers all storms, right? Um, brilliantly illustrated in the gospel passage where they're in the boat. Remember when they're in the boat and, the, and they're getting tossed around by the storm and Jesus is asleep in the boat? And one, I don't know how he slept through all that, but he's asleep in the boat and they wake him up and he says, why did you wake me up? And they said, we're the, the boat, we're about to drown. The boat's about to sink. And he says, you have little faith, right? There are always going to be storms tossing us around. And if you think that just because you have some little bit of faith, that that means nothing bad is ever going to happen, that's not it. The faith, the joy, the peace that God gives is what allows you to sleep like a baby in a boat that's being tossed around on a storm. Um, it's difficult. I'm not going to pretend it's not. So I don't, I don't want to be that person that's trying to convince you that it's easy. And, you know, the more life we live and the more people we know and the more friends we have and the, the more things we go through, the more we realize this is not easy. Um, and it can be very challenging at times, but, but that's what God wants to give us. And so we have to, we, that, that's how we learn. Okay. Any, uh, any questions, any thoughts? Good stuff. Okay. Uh, but yeah, that little book, I think it's like six bucks on Amazon. If you want to pick it up, it's definitely worth it. Um, it's a, it's a good little book. It's one of those that I wish we could just hand out to everybody in the parish. Uh, but but it's a little expensive for that. So, but anyway, okay. Uh, I do just want to remind you, remember November 1st, no meeting tonight um, because we'll be having the Holy Day of Obligation, the masses and everything else and the parish offices will be closed on November 1st. Uh, so just kind of a quick reminder if you're not here next week. And yeah, so if nobody has any questions or comments, we'll go ahead and close. Okay, all right, well. Let's go ahead and say our prayer and I'll let you guys get on with your evening. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. All right. Good night, everyone, and have a wonderful week, and I'll see you around probably this weekend.